The first chance we had to work on a project that was really so profound for our organization was with the black-footed ferret. We got a call from Fish and Wildlife, and we heard the story of the black-footed ferret. It used to range across the Great Plains from Mexico to Canada, and that was until in the 1800s this land actually became agricultural fields. And the black-footed ferrets and their primary source of prey, which is the prairie dog, uh, were all literally exterminated. And by 1981, there were none, until one small population was found in Matitsi, Wyoming. Wyoming Game and Fish brought that small population into captivity, bred them over time, and very successfully have reintroduced them to over 30 uh, sites back into their original range. However, over 30 years, all 10,500 ferrets have been bred in captivity from just a founder gene pool of seven ferrets that had been wild caught. Now, everybody knows that inbreeding is not a great thing. And when species get into smaller and smaller populations, they run the risk of going down the extinction vortex. When smaller populations cause greater uh, genetic drift, lower fertility counts, and even become more susceptible to wildlife diseases, increasing their mortality. Now, when we got the call from Fish and Wildlife to ask if we could help, the first thing we said was, is there any other population that you can bring in to restore uh, genetic diversity? Because that's the typical tool in technology. Bring in a population from another area and increase fertility, lower the mortality rate, increase the population, and becomes more stable. But there was no other population for the black-footed ferret. So we heard that within the San Diego frozen zoo, back 40 years ago, somebody was prescient enough to actually bank cell lines from two other individuals that had been wild caught in 1981, but had never contributed to the gene pool. With that, we did the genomic sequencing on those two cell lines, and we found that they carried up to three times more genetic diversity than any living ferret. So if we could actually clone those ferrets, we could start to build up that population, not by moving animals, but by moving genes. By partnering with the San Diego Zoo and a partner, Viagen, uh, as a cloning company, and with U.S. Fish and Wildlife <clears throat> under their permit, in 2020, we cloned Elizabeth Ann. She's the first, <laughs> she's the first endangered species in America to ever be cloned. Now, this is an amazing success story. And, <laughs> and it was a first for conservation to actually use these technologies in this way. But to me, what's actually almost more amazing is the fact that scientists back in 1980s were prescient enough to start to think about cryopreservation. Now, cloning didn't exist then at all. They didn't know what they were going to do with these cells. And that got us thinking, what else has been ever cryopreserved? It turns out that less than 14% of U.S. endangered species have any form of cryopreservation. That includes uh, plants and animals out of the 1,500. That's an alarming low number. And it's a particularly alarming low number when you realize the rate of extinction loss just in the last 100 years, and the trend keeps going up. So with that, we started talking with officials at Fish and Wildlife Service, and we suggested to them that if we could figure out why this isn't happening, that we could actually help create protocols and, a, and a, actually a roadmap to help ensure that every species that is endangered in the U.S. and the Fish and Wildlife Service has a responsibility to actually get them back off the list. We've said, why don't they just include in that whole process taking a cell culture and ensuring that they, uh, th that species has a reference genome that can be open access and used by researchers all over the world? So with this idea, we're trying to actually bank species for 
the present to help make better management decisions based on their DNA. But the truth is, they're really going to be put in the bank to also help future generations with unknown technologies that are unthinkable today, but could we be transformative in the future. And here's our partner, Seth Willey. This is actually the same guy who called us to ask, could we help him with the black-footed ferret? Ten years later, Seth is a major partner in this whole initiative. You know, we're responsible in the Southwest region for about 200 threatened and endangered species nationwide. We're responsible for about 1,500 threatened and endangered species. And it got me wondering, you know, are we doing our part to set up future generations the same way somebody set up Blackfoot Affair for that success 30 years before by biobanking, by cryogenically preserving that specimen, that sample? And the answer we came to was hit or miss. I mean, we're doing it in little bits here and there. You know, in conservation, if one of the first premises is save what you have, this is one tool that gives us that option to save what we have, not for academic purposes, but for recovery, for genetic rescue and uh, push species back to the point of being biologically viable. In this game, in conservation and endangered species recovery, we're entrusted to protect some of the nation's most valuable and unique biological resources. That conservation legacy is entrusted to us, and we're responsible for trying to arrest a species decline, to manage threats, and to bring species back from the brink. Genetic diversity took millions of years to evolve, and you know we're losing it on our watch. But it's not too late, right? There's still great opportunity for those critters and for many others. It's our responsibility to try to do what we can to save what's there today. So that's what we're doing. We've started this pilot with our first species. That's the Mexican wolf. It is native to New Mexico and Arizona. There are only 200 left in the wild today. And on a routine vet check last month, the field biologist team working with Revive and Restore actually was able to sample that Mexican wolf send off the sample to our culturing partner with Viagen, and it's now on its way for sequencing and will be going for long-term storage at a federal facility. So one down, we've got another 1,500 to do.